winter in County Galway. Ancient lands deserted in the February mists are about to be engulfed in an unseasonal migration of visitors who come to worship the gods of speed as a new rally season starts in the west. At the 11th hour, Clanbridge Crystal have put their welcome all in to sponsor the Galway Motor Club's international event and to help open a new chapter on the Dunlop Tarmac Rally Championship. One of the finest entries ever has gathered in Galway. The reigning Dunlop champion has acquired a pro-drive preferred Subaru Legacy. To be honest, I would say this year it's going to be actually harder even though we have a much better car. Uh, if you take Austin with the Toyota and Bertie with his faithful uh, Cosworth, I mean, uh, those two guys are going to go very hard. And I mean, there's there's a few boys behind there as well. And I mean, they're all, always going to be doing the business uh, as well. From the German headquarters of Toyota's European Competitions Department comes a Celica GT4 for Austin McHale. An excellent car really, it's very quick, excellent brakes and that you know, but uh, we had a little test of dealing there over at jumps and you know it's fantastic the way it handles, no matter what way you'll head up in the air, it'll just land on all four, so you know it is uh, very good. That's a while since we've seen you, is it good to be back? Yeah, I'm delighted to be back and uh, maybe we've got a bit of a problem for this rally uh, with the car being left hand drive, we haven't got time to change the right hand drive yet, it's probably a bit like going out playing uh, an All-Ireland football final and having to play the opposition with a rugby ball. Well, having said that, you know, the, I think the car will make up for a lot of it and uh, it might be a bit rusty for the first few stages. That happened to me now since the circuit last year. So, um, all in all, I hope to be there in the first three and was at least quite tonight and we'll see how it goes on that. Bertie Fisher and Rory Kennedy's four-wheel drive Cosworth is the car that brought them two international victories in 1991. Bertie, amongst the top seeds, you have the advantage of having knowing your car. Yes, uh, we have obviously had a season with the car now, so uh, you know we should be going out there and going straight into it. I just don't know how the other two boys would get on. Obviously, it's the first time out of the cars competitively, so uh, but I don't think it'll take them too long now. You know. Are you a little bit worried that maybe the Subaru or the Toyota would uh, technically be a bit more advanced than this? <laughs> I, I'm not worried about it, but uh, yes, I think the cars are technically more advanced. Um, but you know, we'll have to see. So the 1992 Clarenbridge Crystal Galway International Rally is underway. The first day's stages are in the south of the county, grouped round the market town of Gorge. Now enjoy your first trip in the new Calibre Subaru. Crest into dip 80, crest 33 left. 60. Turn five right. It's not just the it's car that's fast. Left. Robbie Philpot has had to speed up his it's notes to keep up with this flat four flyer. Three right, 30. Turn four left. Damp, 60. Flat crest into right, 30. Two left, maybe. 100. Two right, maybe. With no practice in the car due to a blown turbo earlier in the week, Kenny's early pace is incredible as he sets the fastest time on the first stage. Fisher in the Tough Mac car has an intermittent turbo problem. It's upsetting his plan to take an early advantage as the opposition get used to their new cars. In fact, he's three seconds down on McKinstry after two stages. Frank Marr joined the Cosworth Club last year and he's using his skill to overcome his two-wheel drive disadvantage. There's a brake balance problem in the Sunday World Toyota, which is not good when you're trying to gain confidence in your new car. But it's the left-hand drive configuration, which is the Dubliner's biggest worry. He's four. Bill Connolly's BP BMW is now in its second season in the Kilkenny driver's hands. He shares an early fifth place with his neighbor, Stephen Murphy. Murphy is finding his new four-wheel drive Cosworth different. Considerably different. And here's an early sensation. Stephen Harris has his unusual 16-valve Opel engine Sunbeam up in seventh place. He's certainly rocking the establishment. George Robinson will have a very short rally when a half shaft goes at the start of the next stage. 
Bob Fiden, as expected, leads Group N. He's ahead of many of the Group A examples. Including the two County Cork entries of Franco Mani and Vincent Mead. Frank Stein on Turbo Boost and Vincent last time when he stalled on stage one. The ever stylish Connie Smith is not just a crowd pleaser, his sideways style is also effective as he leads the two litre clubman's class. Jim Crozier is another contender in that class. 20 year old Garth McCartney, Desi McCartney's son, is having his first run in a Group N Cosworth. National champion Donny Keating is only a spectator today as he waits for his old Metro with Vincent Whelan at the wheel. But Vincent has been delayed with a puncture. Stages three and four are very fast in places and Bertie has moved ahead by a slender two seconds as he drives his heart out across the hills east of Gort. This is flat in fifth stuff and not for the faint-hearted as the 1990 champion wrestles with the Cosworth at frightening speeds. Galway is one of the internationals that Fisher has yet to claim and we are seeing the Fermanagh driver at his very best. The Subaru is constantly on the rev limiter as the Bambridge driver immediately feels at home with his new 80,000 pound toy. It's a tribute to his skill that he's adapted so quickly to the Japanese supercar. But in many ways, Frank Banner is the most impressive of all as he throws caution to the wind in his undergeared Cosworth to stay in touch with the four-wheel drive rivals and ahead of McHale's, who is a mere two seconds behind. The highly sophisticated, electronically controlled braking system is still giving Austin a few heart attacks, but he's more than happy with the potential of his new car. Bill Connolly is admitting that his commitment has been a little erratic. While Stephen Murphy's pace in the Tegral four-wheel drive Cosworth, despite a lack of power steering, seems to make one photographer a little cautious in choosing his vantage point. In amongst all this sophisticated machinery, Stephen Harris still holds seventh place. Is it any wonder? Fountain has now moved up to eighth overall, and Waterford driver David Flynn is one of no less than eight Group A Cosworths in the entry, as is John Galise. Sadly, Franco Manny will shortly retire with mechanical maladies, and Vincent Mead will crash out. Not so Connie Smith, who continues to opposite lock his way round County Galway. Vincent Whelan's Metro is now on target following gear selection difficulties. And then we see two local drivers in their Group N Sapphire Cosworths, Martin Ward from Loch Ray and Diggy Madden from Galway City. Locking a rear wheel in his front wheel drive Group N Astra, Donald Bones, who leads his class. Michael Murray in his Group A version is losing a lot of time as the Astra is stuck in fourth gear for the entire stage. Here's another likely class winner, Ian Calvin, who has changed from an Astra to a Nova and moved up to Group A. With the first loop completed, McKinstry arrives back in Gort for service, but Fisher has the advantage. It's uh, obviously better to be three seconds in front and three seconds behind, but uh, we were a little bit slow just getting started out this morning, you know, just a little bit cautious. The roads were very, very slippery. and. Uh, but I wasn't really surprised to see Kenny going so well, you know, I always reckoned that he would adapt very, very quickly to the car. Uh, so we're happy enough, you know, we have a problem with our engine, just it's uh, not boosting properly. And the last stage we were only, well, we were down about 25% on boost pressure, so uh, it's making a little bit of difference to it, you know. Well, what can you do about that? Well, the boys are working on it here now, but it's, unfortunately, it's an inter intermittent fault. And uh, those are always more difficult to uh, find than the, you know, if it wasn't working at all. Uh, but um, I don't know, it's, we'll just have to see if they find something now, you know. The car is brilliant. Uh, it, it seems to go over jumps quite well. The last stage there, we've never been as high 
uh, in any rally car, uh, and I'm sure the in-car camera, you'll see that. Uh, we actually thought that it was going to roll end over end, so it kicks the back of it up quite, quite a lot. Um, it's very much a learning process, you know. The, the car feels good, it's good over bumps. We seem to be losing out on top speed, uh, with the stages being very fast. It's on the rev limiter quite a bit, but I'm sure all the other guys are having those sort of problems as well. But. The in-car camera is the focus of attention as Robbie Philpot examines an earlier incident. We're not quite sure what happened. I think at one time there the car had control of us rather than us having control of the car. Um, came too deep down into a corner, it locked up and we weren't sure whether to try and make the corner or just go straight on. And at the end of the day the car decided it was going straight on and that was it. But no damage done? No damage, no. Just reversed out of it and dropped probably five, ten seconds, something like that. But no, no major problems. Frank and Michael Marr, no relation, are changing the differential to give them more top speed, but despite the low gearing, they still hold third place. Austin McHale's Tom Hogan Motors Toyota continues to have stopping problems. So far, so we have had a brake problem. We have had uh, very little brakes in the front, so in the wet conditions, we're at the back locking up very, very bad. But I think we've sorted out now. We had uh, something wrong with front brake pads. But having said that, I went off in the second stage, maybe dropped 15, 20, 22, 23 seconds and it took the wind out of me a bit, but uh, it takes a lot of getting used to, you know, we're sitting on the left-hand side, into turbocharged, power steering, so there's three things that we have to cope with that to get out of the BMW. And, uh, you know, the car is very good, it's very quick, handles well, it's a very forgiving car, you know, so I am happy with the car, but I would definitely like to have it on right-hand drive, and uh, I think that I'd be dropping about two seconds of by the way it is at the moment. <laughs> First stage on the second loop, and Fisher really has the hammer down. The Sierra increases its lead by four seconds on this stage. The engine problems are now remedied by the meat team, so it's maximum attack. With four stages behind him, McKinstry is beginning to show us what he can do with his new legacy. And Barr is already 1 minute 12 seconds behind the advance of technology. But increasing his lead over Austin McHale, who continues to struggle with the unfamiliarity of sitting on the wrong side of the car. Bill Connolly has changed onto 17-inch rims, and it's a big improvement. Jim Crozier is still battling with Tony Smith for the 2-litre honours in the modified category. Martin Ward complains of a sticky gearbox. Trevor Callers is making an impressive debut in the large Group N category. But Garth McCartney's challenge will shortly hit problems. Tommy McDonald leads the 1600 modified class. And as we leave stage five, Anthony O'Halloran gives us a few exciting moments. The presence of the three supercars has brought the crowds in their thousands to Galway, and they're enjoying every minute of this speed festival. Remember that visit into the hedge and the first run over Loch Kutra? Well, that corner is coming up again. 40, 3 left. 30. 3 right, maybe. 40. 1 right, 100. Left over crest into 2 right, 40. 1 left, 34 left. Into caution, 2 left and open 5 right. Here it comes. 5 left. No reprimand from Robbie, but a reminder that it was the same corner. That's right, that was it. Long press. This stage presents the first real problems for the Calibre team, as the power steering has gone on the Subaru Legacy, and Kenny will drop 33 seconds on the Lock Kutra test. It's the sort of break that Fisher needs, as he must build up a lead on the first day if he has to hold off the others as they get familiar with their new cars. Frank Maher is not only maintaining his third place, he's now 22 seconds ahead of McHale, who continues to have brake problems.
Bill Connolly is almost a minute behind in the BP car. And John Galise is three and a half minutes behind that in eighth place after two punctures. Trevor Cathers is too long at this game to try anything chancy in a new car, but his pace is sufficient to hold second in Group M. Jim Crozier, now a fully paid up member of the Crossed Elbows Club, gives us some of that old-time escort entertainment, as does the Bantry driver, Dennis Cronin. Donald Bowens has been in contact with Iggy Madden after the Galway driver had spun. Seamus Murphy has moved to Ford after many years with GM products. And Ian Calvin's acclimatization in his new Nova hasn't taken long. He's in 12th position. Monaghan's Pat McMahon gives us a nice sideways moment. And here's another new car-driver combination, Seamus Geary in a Honda. In the midst of that mechanical mist is an almost unrecognisable Renault 5 Turbo belonging to John Carson. He and Philip Jackson have been off the road just around the corner and as Seamus Carroll passes, they pit for repairs. It's a battle against time to stay in the rally, but the damage is heavy and the Ulster garage is entry and they are only halfway through one of the longest stages in the rally. But the hazard lights aren't only for the Renault pair. Joe Donoghue may be more mobile, but the local driver's escort is not a pretty sight. At last, John Carson has the Renault on the move again. But sadly, it will all be to no avail, as they will shortly retire. Further up the Loch Coutre stage, McKinstry's right. power steering problems yeah, have become acute. Right and left, caution 40, turn 5 left and gravel. 200. That steam is from the hydraulic steering system. One, it's 200 down here. At the end of the stage, Robbie tries to call the chase cars. Sumo one to two, over. Fortunately, at the main road, Sam McIntyre is waiting. Engine oil somewhere. It's not very serious, but in the haste, the service crew have only secured one bonnet pin. The bullet's lifting. Fortunately, the screen's still intact, but the aluminium bonnet is badly bent. Now Robbie has a problem, as there's only one pin left to secure it. Although they're off the stage, they mustn't incur road penalties. And eventually, they limp into court service, where we catch up with the story. Got a bit of damage there on the front. Yeah, fortunately for uh, all the wrong reasons. Um, we had problems with the power steering. I think there's a pipe or else the pump is bust. On the start of that last stage, we lost quite a bit of time. But uh, down the road section there, the, the bonnet just blew up, so... What's uh, the smoke? The smoke is the power steering. Uh, we don't have any. Apart from that, you're getting to like this car? Oh, it's brilliant. Absolutely fabulous. For sure. Uh, I mean, I would still be learning a lot about it. Uh, we have had slippery conditions this morning, we've had wet conditions, and now it's starting to dry out, so... It's, uh, it's all changing, really, so... You had Bertie very much in your sights there before this happened? Uh, for sure, aye. Uh, Bertie had taken four off us on one, we took four back. Uh, Bertie took seven off us then on the previous one, and I was all set for to take the seven back, but it didn't happen. Obviously Kenny had a problem on the last stage there, with his power steering, but um, we had taken a few seconds off him on the previous stages, so uh, obviously we've got a little bit of a cushion now and we'll have to try and protect it. 
As you feared, the Subaru is very quick. Yes, I knew it would be, and I also knew that uh, Kenny's the sort of guy who can get into any car. He drives so many rally cars, and uh, he can just get in there and go from the word go, you know. We're going well now since we changed the drift there on the last service. Um, we were able to pull 130 instead of 125 now, and uh, it made a good difference on the first stage out, but we had equal time on the second stage, but pulled back some time in the third and fourth. But um, it should make a difference all, all round. Car is sounding really crisp. Car's perfect. I mean, even the restriction now hasn't really upheld us a lot. We have a problem uh, with the meter and the unit that's on the dash. Apparently, the gearbox is low on oil and uh, the whole transmission system, there's a little black box in it and uh, we have a major problem with brakes this morning locking up the back wheels and when the back locks up with the four wheel drive it tends to start to lock the front to the front so we're afraid we push the back tip, obviously the four wheel drive the whole system locks up so they have that disconnected now and they have it taken out and we've done the last stage on a 50-50 drive but uh, we'll wait and see, the Brennan's going to strip that box now and see if they can do anything with it, we haven't got one and we won't get one from Cologne in time so you know we'll have to keep on the way we are I love to get four wheel drive. <laughs> <laughs> you think it's the answer? Well, certainly uh, out of junctions and that, it's it has to be a major advantage. We're spinning wheels. When I would imagine the four wheel drive cars are just. But the weather is now coming to your advantage, really. Yes, yeah, it's um, getting better for us, all right. So if we can get the, get the commitment and confidence up. Right. And we go a bit better, you know. But it certainly has been better for us the last few stages. I seem to go asleep on stage three every time. I... Gort is full to overflowing as a horde swarm round the mechanical wizards who can rebuild rally cars in minutes. George Robinson is now a spectator as the McKinstry team set out to repair the power steering. All too soon, time is up, and it's back to the stages and the final four tests of the day. The last loop on Saturday, and an instant change in the weather, which catches almost everyone by surprise. Fisher is a little more fortunate than most, as he's managed to slip on Monte Carlo pattern Pirelli's before the start of the stage, and he's four seconds faster than McKinstry. Kenny is on the wrong Dunlops, but relieved to have his power steering restored. On this surface, he needs it. Frank Maher continues to put in one of the drives of his life. In the wettest stage of this loop, he'll take fastest time. This is not vintage McHale, but Galway is the first step in Austin's master plan for the Toyota. Watch this space. Connolly graphically illustrates the disadvantages of two-wheel drive in these conditions, especially on slick tyres. While Stephen Murphy, the national championship runner-up, is finding the transition to four-wheel drive pretty difficult. Crozier slides on, and he'll finish the day in 15th place. Martin Ward and Tommy Glynn are third in the large Group N class. But are being caught by Dennis Cronin's escort on this stage. And Dubliner Des Bruton demonstrates that his Peugeot is definitely rear-wheel drive. The damage caused when Bone's car hit the Cosworth is highly visible on Iggy Madden's car. And Declan Clark's rear-wheel drive Mark II Escort can't be doing too many miles to the liter. Garth McCartney has been in the wars after a front wheel blowout. He's still in the rally, but at the tail of the field.
the action is over for the day. It's been a tough day and tough Max day. Freddie, I believe the only problem today has not been with the car at all. It's been with yourself. Yeah, I seem to have hurt my back on the second stage and uh, it's been giving me a bit of a bother for probably about four stages, five stages after that. But it's not just as bad now, so uh, hopefully it's not going to be a problem, you know. And the car's going beautifully out here. Yeah, the car's going fine. Eh? Uh, we had problems earlier on in the day with uh, an intermittent fault in the uh, turbo boost, but it seems to have cured itself now, or the boys have cured it, I don't know which. Well, it wouldn't have anything to do with this uh, revival of this old partnership with Sydney Big. Well, it? that could have something to do with it, all right. You know, <laughs> that certainly could have something to do with it. Sydney, nice to see you back uh, working on Irish soil. Thanks very much. Obviously, things are going according to plan. It's going quite well. I mean, we're still getting used to the cars more than anything else. We have a slight problem with the ECU in this here, which we can't do anything about in this event. We just don't have spares. But other than that, the cars going well. Gareth, I hear you've had a, a fairly dramatic day. Yes, uh, well, we were going nicely towards the start of the day, and then uh, in stage eight there, we had a puncher, which uh, lost us eight, uh, six minutes, unfortunately. Uh, so it's dropped us down a bit. We're, I think we're running the uh, second last car on the road at the moment. So uh, it was a bit unfortunate, but uh, that's rallying, I suppose. The father's over here with me, uh, keeping an eye on me, as it were. The opportunity came up to do this event, and uh, well, I just grabbed at it, and, thought it'd be too good to turn down. 45 crews are still in the Claren Bridge Galway International Rally as they await the restart on Sunday morning. The presence of the four-wheel drive supercars has been an enormous draw and the comparative specifications of these state-of-the-art Group A machines are interesting. The Subaru Legacy is probably the least powerful with its flat four 1994 cc turbocharged engine. Where it's outstanding, is in its road handling and suspension travel. It's also very light at 1,100 kilograms. The Toyota GT4 has seen a lot of development with its 1988cc four-in-line turbocharged engine giving easily the 300 brake horsepower maximum permitted by FISA. It's also the same weight as the Subaru at 1,100 kilograms. The Ford Cosworth 4x4 RS is the heaviest at 1,190 kilograms but also reckoned to be very powerful. It has a 1998cc turbocharged four-in-line unit. Seven stages in the Hedford area lie ahead on the Sunday run, so how do the top men plan to play it? Well, we're obviously going to try and hold position. We have uh, 55 seconds lead, which really isn't a lot because, uh, you know, a puncture or something like that and it can all be gone. So uh, we'll try and drive steady and keep it between the ditches, you know. Fairly steady pace and see if we can start taking a bit of time off Verde. Can you, are you still hopeful of a win? Uh, anything's possible. Uh, we had so much uh, varying conditions yesterday. Uh, it changed quite a lot, so if it's wet all day today, we're, you know, who's to know? We're just going to go out there and see. Frank, what's the plan for today? Nice and steady, hold our position and pray for rain again. We seem to go well in the rain, seem to be able to compete again. So I'll dry is better on the rain than on the dry. It oh, shouldn't be, you're only two-wheel drive. It shouldn't be, but it seems to work. We'll uh, go a bit quicker today. I think we've got the brake problem sorted out now. Uh, unfortunately, we dropped a lot of time yesterday. We had that uh, the um, ducting system in the front came off the car and got wrapped up in the prop shaft. So um, it dropped a bit of time over the last two stages. We're lying forward at the moment. We're happy with that. Like, I'm very happy with the car. The car has prospects of being an excellent car. And uh, we have no major mechanical problems as such. But uh, when I get more use of the car, it's definitely going to be a lot more competitive, and I reckon there's another three or four seconds in my island. Bob, what's the plan for today? Well, the first plan, uh, plan is to find the key of the car. We've lost the keys of the car somewhere, so we've managed to get into it now. Uh, I believe I gave them to Jerry last night. He's not too sure. We're going to go back to the hotel now and have a look. I've got a different jacket on now, and I might have left it in my jacket, which is in the car outside the hotel. So that's, that's the first plan now. So it's a bit of a panic. Well, there is a panic. I think, we've got about, um, I think we've got about 10 or 15 minutes, something like that now, before we start. So there is a panic. Well, we'll keep you. Thank you very much. Thank you. So we're on the road again and heading north to Hedford. And the big question mark is the weather. It's raining one minute, dry the next. Tire choice will be critical. Wheels are changed before the first stage and the in-car cameras set up for the day. Uh, we have to check all the connections. Uh, check we have uh, actual re a recording because the camera has been used in a very arduous situation. And we make ensure that we're actually getting pictures. Uh, 
it's the, the lifespan of the, the heads on the machine might be three, three events. So we try to ensure that we always have pictures. Now obviously the light will change quite a lot during the day. Does that cause problems for you? It causes problems in the early morning or late evening. Um, from about three o'clock today, I have to constantly monitor my light levels. After a long delay caused by the Galway Motor Club's efforts to control the enormous crowds, the Kilbeg Pier stage is at last underway, and Fisher, like many other drivers, is caught in the wrong tyres. Stage 13 will be unlucky for many. The roads are like glass and even the top men can make mistakes. Bertie and Rory will have a second incident on this stage and they drop 16 seconds to Kenny and Robbie Philpott. The Subaru will be the fastest over this treacherous nine and a half mile stage. And so the early bird award goes to Kenny McKinstry for the second day running. Press and turn five right. Now we travel the same piece of road as Fisher. Into right over crest 100. To see if he will be caught out in the treacherous right left hand. Here right. it comes. 30. Safely right round. 100. Maher's car control is uncanny. Driving his powerful two-wheel drive Cosworth on surfaces that will catch out a third of the entry. Austin is second fastest as he cocks the rear wheel in the Dunlop shod Toyota. Bill Connolly is having back axle problems as he tries to get 295 horsepower down on the slimy surfaces. The Gorebridge driver comes dangerously close this time. That's Stephen Murphy in the ditch. And Bob Fountain passes him into sixth place. And it looks like the Welshman has also been in the scenery. But worse is to come, much worse for the Group N leader. Fortunately, it's only time wasting rather than terminal. Stephen Harris passes Murphy into seventh place, but the Donegal driver isn't entirely happy as the Opel engine sending is difficult to drive due to a sticking throttle. Murphy limps to safer ground as John Galiste demotes him to ninth. This truly amateur driver with Chris Patterson on the notes is again in the top ten, but that is about to change. The Group A car is not badly damaged, but the accident is very time-wasting. The Belfast dentist will finish the event, but back in 11th place. Came into the first uh, friend and she just locked solid on the front and had no brakes on the back. So she just careered and just cut the front wheel. So we had to go through the stage with the steering arm broken. There are near misses and evidence of accidents everywhere. Martin Ward's been at the wall, his first rally accident in almost 20 years. Des Bruton and Frank Waters have an overshoot at the top of the hill. But he'll finish in third in his class, while Garth McCartney chooses the bottom of the hill to have his moment 
The young driver will finish third in his class. Dermot and Darren Caldwell have a puncher in their group end Cosworth. Sean Hurley goes through as the Caldwell Cosworth still lies stranded. Only 15 minutes lateness is allowed and it's getting dangerously close to that. Gabriel Snow, seen briefly in the background, will win the small Group N category. And at last, Caldwell is on the move, but he has dropped a lot of time. Galway drivers Tom Holliday and Michael O'Reardon join the casualty list on stage 13. But they are luckier than most. Greg McCormick and Ruth McCracken are lucky to get away with this one as they continue with their pride and their escort dented. Remember that right-hander that caught out Fisher of Fowden and Galice? Well, look at the havoc it reaped with the later numbers. Rides are out in their thousands, despite the weather. And they all have their favourites. My favourite is Bertie Fisher. McKinstry. <laughs> Austin McKeon. Kenny McKinstry. Austin McKeon. Who are you following this weekend? Um. <laughs> <laughs> now the gap is down to 39 seconds. With this and five other stages to come, Fisher must keep cool under this pressure. For McKinstry, it's caution to the winds as he throws his new charge around like an old friend. Barr may be a minute and a half behind the leader, but he's built more than a minute between himself and McHale. Alston is beginning to entertain as he tucks out his oriental tail for the cameras. The BMWs are further two minutes down. while the Group N leader is a lot more exuberant than usual. Stephen Harris continues to hit the headlines, less than a minute behind the Cosmo. And now for the entertainers. Escorts don't quite qualify for the historic class. They keep great rallying moments alive, 20 years after their heyday. JJ Fleming has Stephen Murphy's old car. Kieran O'Neill's got out of the wall. Greg McCormick's providing more of the entertainment we enjoyed so much in Kalani. And Thomas Holton's Starion handles as badly as it looks after his trip over the dry stone wall. The gap is up to 47 seconds now, with Fisher's chances looking more secure as the miles are eaten up. Kenny has had an overshoot, and now he learns the new handbrake technique in this Subaru. Frank Maher makes it look so easy, as he tweaks the handbrake to great effect. Despite a tone of optimism, Austin must be a little bit disappointed not to be in the top three. Connolly will change his back axle and shock absorbers at the next service. 
Stephen Murphy is still going, but he lost five places on stage 13. Class winner Connie Smith demonstrates the classic way to glide a rear wheel drive car around a hairpin, while another class winner, Ian Calvin, shows us the front wheel drive way. Martin Ward's Cosworth gets worse by the mile. However, the Galway pair will get it home. Back at Hedford, we learn the reason for Stephen Murphy's earlier crash. On the start of the first stage, there was about half an hour delay, and uh, we were up at the, talking to Austin and the lads, and uh, obviously somebody must have turned the balance bar completely to the front with the brakes. So I came into the first... For somebody? I don't know. I wish I did. <laughs> the window was down, you see and anybody could just put their hand in and turn it. But the brakes were definitely out to the front because when it brakes, you just lock solid in the front and just clip the, the front wheel off a stone. She just careered over across the road, you know. But somebody may have been an inquisitive young relation. Anyway, Stephen has lost five places. Just four stages to go, and the Tough Mac car looks all set to take another international rally win. Bertie, left back over crest. Bertie Fisher and Rory Kennedy have a 47 second advantage but nothing is ever certain in rallying. We're nearing the end of stage 16. Right left over crest, and left at house, 70, double caution. Very fast left, tight. Fast right minus. Slight right. Right over crest, and crest, 50, double caution. Crest in the square right, slipping, water. The front suspension is broken. The Tough Mac car is in big trouble. The wheels tucked under the car, but fortunately they're off the stage. Can they remain in the rally? At stage 17, we anxiously await the Cosworth, but to everybody's surprise, it's the Subaru that appears first. Can Fisher have lost yet another international at the 11th hour? Maher jumps higher than anyone. Could it be for joy at gaining second place? Has Austin at last gained third place? And those valuable early Dunlop championship points that he came to Galway to collect? Just as we are about to leave the stage, Fisher appears in a very aggressive mood. But what damage has that suspension breakage done to his position in the event? Further down the road, we meet up with the unfortunate crew in a road section between stages 17 and 18. First stage, the second, first stage, the second time round, uh, going down about 150 yards down the street, just to the very finish at square right. Just a little bump, like it wasn't even a big bump. We never went over this bump. It was just a snap. Um, the wheel came back up underneath the car, and but I thought we were just going to go straight on through the wall, like, but somehow or other I managed to get around the corner and didn't hit the car. But then the car wouldn't move because the wheel was just jammed and it had broken a track control arm and broken a drive shaft. And we got out of the stage and it just, we lost, you know, it wasn't actually an official service, so we lost road time. Uh, we lost uh, 90 seconds road time. And then the car wasn't perfectly straight, you know, because the boys didn't have a chance to track the wheels and so on, so we had to take it easy on the last stage as well. And lost another Where are you in the rally? Maybe second. We're maybe second, possibly third. Well, what a disappointment. Yeah, very disappointing. Galway at dusk for the final stage of the Clarenbridge Crystal International. And the buzz around the city is that Kenny McKinstry has taken a dramatic late lead. The calibre luck is in again, and McKinstry is not going to do anything stupid just to entertain the citizens of Galway.
There's little over a mile to go, and they have a one and a half minute advantage. Yet, despite their gently, gently approach, they still take the fastest time on the city centre spectator stage. It's the final duel in a weekend which has given McKinstry the crown and his second international rally win. You would think things couldn't get any worse for Bertie. But they just have. That bang was first gear going in the Cosworth six-speed gearbox. Obviously distracted by his last-minute misfortune, Bertie now overshoots. And to make matters worse, that gearbox can't get him going again. It's cold comfort. But with all the last minute drama in the Tough Mac team, Bertie and Rory are lucky to finish second in the opening event of the 1992 Tarmac Championship. Yet once again, Fisher has had a prize snatched away from him at the 11th hour. It's been one of Frank Marr's best weekends ever, perhaps his best drive yet. To finish third, and only nine seconds behind Fisher, is fantastic. Austin McHale and Dermot O'Gordon are a disappointing fourth, but everyone in Galway is convinced that their day will come, and soon, in the Toyota. Bill Connolly and James O'Brien were fifth at the end of the first stage, and they're fifth at the end of the rally. And Bob Fodden starts his 1992 Dunlop campaign with the maximum group end points. But Stephen Harris's seventh heaven nearly comes to grief in the last hundred yards of the rally. Back to Air Square two days later, and the city belongs to the Subaru pair. Kenny, congratulations. Looks like 92 has started the way 91 finished. Uh, yeah, we're definitely very pleased. Uh, there's a bit of a bit of testing went on earlier on, probably in the, the first few stages. Uh, we got very little testing done on it, and uh, it was just basically feeling the car and how it was going to work. Robbie, what are, what are the big memories of this weekend? I think probably just the sheer performance out of this car. I, it's been some years since I've got excited ever getting into a car and starting a rally, but uh, just starting one stage, the start line on this car is phenomenal. It's unbelievable. Uh, it just pins you back into your seat. and, and uh, just throughout the event, we were just totally surprised by how quickly the whole thing can go. It was disappointing because um, you know we finished it second in this rally two years ago, and after having led it for a long way as well, you know. So, uh, but in I terms of the championship, it. second place is better than a non-finish. Oh, certainly, yeah, it's uh, certainly a good consolation prize in terms of championship terms. The 1992 Dunlop Tarmac Championship has all the potential of being one of the most interesting ever staged on these shores, with Kenny McKinstry taking the early high ground. Round two is on the Circuit of Ireland at Easter.